thanks for coming out, guys, uh, and, uh, and checking out my presentation on the Internet of Things. Um, it's a topic that I'm very, very fascinated about, with. Um, not something I do on a day-to-day -day basis for work, but um, I've been kind of tinkering uh, with the inter Internet of Things and reading a lot about it, so I um, kind of wanted to share that with you guys a little bit today. Um, so today I'm going to walk through um, a simple uh, Rails-based um, Internet of Things app that I've built, um, and then kind of talk around some of the background and context around the uh, inter Internet of Things, um, and then also talk through um, the future of the Internet of Things and kind of where I see, um, where, where I kind of see it going. So kind of just a quick uh, background and introduction um, uh, around me. So I um, had kind of a roller coaster of a career, which is um, I've, I've tried and done a lot of kind of various different things. Started off as a political science major, then went into business where I tried management consulting and venture capital. Um, before I kind of started teaching myself to learn to code, really loved it, so went to the Flatiron School um, and kind of to, to get a formal education there. Um, and now I'm uh, working at a small legal tech startup um, called CaseFlex. So um, certainly don't have the um, number of years of experience that a lot of uh, I know a lot of you guys have, but uh, but I love it. It's uh, it's it's been an awesome ride so far. I'm, I'm very excited uh, to be here today as well. Um, and for, on a day-to-day -day, day basis, um, I use Rails um, uh, and Angular. Um, and uh, I've kind of, as I mentioned, as kind of an uh, Internet of Things um, nerd, I've, uh, I've really uh, gotten into to kind of tinkering a lot with Raspberry Pis and Arduinos as well. Um, so uh, before I kind of get into the presentation, let me walk you through my daily routine. Um, just a quick disclaimer, I had, uh, I brought all the stuff here, um, but I figured the uh, demo might be a little bit better if you guys can see it there, and I also videotaped it. So um, I'll just show you guys the, the video of the app. Um, screen. Cool. Basically, um, uh, I, I'll, I'll go through kind of what, what is it, it's actually doing um, a little bit more in detail, but um, I have the, uh, the actual web app on the, on the left um, and uh, my kind of, uh, the, my Internet of Things um, set up at home on the right, um, and I'll kind of go through what my, what my daily routine is. Um, so in the morning, I wake up, um, I turn my lights on, but um, I'm really cranky in the morning, so I need to turn, d dim my lights a little bit, so I do that. Um, as the day kind of progresses, it's supposed to be good to kind of get a redder type of light um, uh, for your circadian rhythm. So I, using kind of a form uh, there, I kind of ch start changing the color uh, of my light as well. Um, then um, after that, kind of the next step, um, I really need some caffeine. What I do is um, I go out to the appliances tab and uh, I turn on my coffee maker. Um, and as you can see, um, I start getting a little bit of coffee uh, that starts uh, coming down and, and, and being made. Um, and that's all connected to uh, an Arduino. And I've, if you guys want to see afterwards the setup, I can sh show you that afterwards. Um, then, sorry about the sound effects there. Uh, so then I can turn my coffee maker off once I've got enough. And then uh, I, turn on, uh, I turn on my favorite music playlist. So I'm playing, I'm playing happy. I'm usually never happy in the morning. So um, it's trying to pump me up a little bit, but usually never works. Um, then as I'm leaving, as I'm leaving the door, my, my apartment, um, what I do is I turn on my uh, security, my motion detector, right? On the right side, you see a little graph, and that's, um, that kind of lights up every time there's motion. And you should see kind of the graph over time changing with a count of motions as well. Um, and that's all on the front end. Um, it's cut off a little bit there, so I just threw it in. Um, uh, on the on the right side as well. So as you can see, the little uh, this it's like this thing here, but you can see it's like a little motion detector. Um, and so I set that up, I set that up before before I leave. Um, if I want, I can also set kind of a um, uh, rather than a silent alarm, it's kind of a louder alarm. So um, so again, kind of setting up that motion detector, but now connecting it with uh, uh, with a with a Sonos um, and kind of having the two interact with one another. 
Um, during the day, um, when I'm coding, I like to listen to beats. And then um, at the end of the day, um, after maybe on a Friday or a Saturday or so, um, I just want to kind of unwind a little bit, so I have a party. <laughs> So that's kind of uh, a quick overview of, um, of the app that I've built. So I, I'll kind of go into more detail uh, and it's in, into how that's, uh, how that's working out. All right, so the high level stack around this uh, uh, Internet of Things application is, um, so I've got an app, Angular application um, and that's running um, in the cloud. Um, and I've, I'm kind of serving that up with our uh, using DivShot. And I don't know if you guys have used DivShot before. It's really cool. Um, it's kind of like Heroku, but for static applications, it's really easy just to push um, applications up. Um, then uh, the Angular application um, consumes the API um, from my Rails app. And the Rails app is actually running locally um, on a uh, Raspberry Pi. Um, and that's kind of serving kind of the, the, the Rails application and the um, API with that. And um, I'm running that on the Raspberry Pi, which is on my home network, um, because uh, I, can't, I, I can't actually push that up on like a Heroku AWS or something, because I need it, I need it to actually be running on the home network, because a lot of, uh, a lot of the objects, some of the smart, smarter objects, so like a Sonos or like a LifeX light bulb, um, those are already connected to your home network. So in order to kind of use their APIs, you need to be on that home network as well. Um, right now, I'm kind of um, serving that up to the web with ngrok. It's kind of a really easy tunneling tool to kind of put your uh, development environment um, up, up on the web. And this is kind of me kind of testing out this Internet of Things application. Um, and then the, um, the Rails app then connects uh, both uh, smart objects um, as well as uh, dumb objects. So smart objects are the ones that are already um, connected uh, to the internet. So these are the ones that you're probably going to pay a huge premium for uh, right now. So like a light bulb, like a regular light bulb, I don't know, it's like a dollar or so, right? Um, and then the connected light bulb is $100. So, um, you know, 100 times the premium for it to be connected to the internet. So right now, it's, uh, the Rails app actually connects to um, the uh, LifeX light bulb and the Sonos, which are both smart. And the Sonos actually um, works off of, uh, uh, with Dropbox. So I'm actually sending it files um, from Dropbox uh, on the cloud just for portability so it doesn't have to depend on um, the files to be on my um, local machine. Um, then I've also got a number of um, dumb objects as, as well. So um, is the sound cutting in and out? No. Um, so uh, my coffee maker, this is a $10 coffee maker. Um, I'm, I've got that connected. Um, to the internet, uh, and, and I'm able to turn that on and off with my application as well. Um, and as well as um, the motion detector as well. That's actually like a $5 motion detector, so it's, it's really, really cheap. Um, and I do that all with an Arduino. I'm kind of splicing um, their circuits to be able to kind of send, send signals on when I want to turn the power on and turn the power off. Um, the cool thing is, because the front end kind of lives in the cloud, I can actually um, I can actually control this stuff anywhere, um, uh, from, from anywhere. So I can be at the office and, um, uh, and be able to turn on, turn off my lights, just you know, make sure things are off. Um, same with my appliances. I'm starting to connect a, um, uh, a slow cooker to this as well, so that now I can um, actually start turning on my slow cooker just in, so it, it, my food will be ready by, by the time that I come home. Um, so what is the Internet of Things? Um, it's literally... Um, object-oriented programming. Um, you're connecting to physical objects um, through code. <laughs> and you're seeing the Internet of Things really pop up um, everywhere right now. Um, health and fitness monitors, home security devices, connected cars, household appliances, um, and a ton of other applications out there. Um, but there's also a lot of uh, non-consumer uh, consumer applications as well. So um, we're seeing the Internet of Things. Um, for example, local governments are starting to use a lot of sensors to be able to look at their infrastructure um, and be able to see if there's any kind of you know, w water or gas leaks or whatever before, before the actual damage occurs. So um, really uh, a lot of uh, cool stuff uh, happening in this space. But so why is it important? Um, I think there's really three reasons. The most important reason um, is that um, it allows you to kind of better, more easily uh, interact with the world around us. So before, let's take a Nest thermometer, for example, right? 
before we, when we had to go um, to the wall unit and kind of turn it up and down or turn it off or remember to turn it off when we walk out the door. Um, we can now you know, use an app to control uh, the temperature and then, this, then over time um, it starts kind of learning our routines and being able to better, um, better meet our needs and, and so, so we can kind of more easily interact with it. Um, the second reason why I think it's so important is um, it's already really, really big. Um, we've seen a huge uh, explosion over the past uh, five years or so um, in, the, uh, in the Internet of Things space. Um, and uh, we're seeing kind of a lot of these connected devices pop up all over the place. A lot of companies uh, starting to get into the space, big, big ones, startups, um, everything. Um, but I think it's going to get even bigger. Um, there's been a lot of research, uh, research reports um, that say that um, by 2020 there's going to be uh, and it, all the research reports seem to cite 2020 as kind of the, the, the end goal and the big where we're going to see a lot of um, change. But by 2020, we're going to see 40 to 80 billion um, connected objects, and that's 10 connected objects for, uh, for every human on the planet um, at that time. Um, I just read a, a report that came out today saying that, the, um, that the health, in, in 2020, the healthcare uh, Internet of Things market will be a... Um, uh, it's going to be a $117 billion market. So um, a lot of big numbers uh, in this space. I think kind of the most important reason why the Internet of Things is really so important um, is because it really increases the amount of data um, that we have uh, out there. So typically big data, we kind of think of that as the, all the data that's kind of on the web, um, on all our users. We're getting this from applications. Um, but more and more, big data is going to be comprised of the things that, uh, that actually occur uh, in the physical world and actual um, uh, uh, physical interactions that we have um, uh, in, in the real world. So everything from like a light bulb um, to a thermostat to wearable devices, um, they're, really, they're, they're going to become sources of data um, that, that, that we can use and, and analyze and, and, and hopefully... Uh, make our lives kind of even better with. Um, and this is kind of the, the notion of quantified self, um, where these technologies really help us to better understand and anal analytically look at our daily routines and our lives in general. But um, it's not just quantifying ourselves. Uh, so fun fact, I read about this uh, just recently about this Dutch startup that started. Uh, they, they've built, built these sensors for cows. And you stick these sensors on a cow, and the farmer is able to tell um, when they're able to kind of get all this data on the cow, uh, when the cow's eating, sleeping, um, when the cow's pregnant, when it's sick. Um, and a cow uh, generates 200 megabytes of data per year. Um, so if an animal that sleeps 12 and a half hours a day um, and eats for another 10 hours a day generates that much data, imagine how much data a human can generate or, um, or even something like a car. Um, I, think, I think there's just going to be so much data out there. Um, so as I was kind of building, um, uh, as I was kind of thinking about what I was going to talk about today um, in terms of the Internet of Things and this application I was building, wasn't exactly sure um, what I was going to talk about um, initially. So I just started building, and then as some uh, some issues arose, um, that's kind of what helped to drive kind of the topics that that I want to talk about. Um, so initially uh, with this application, I uh, started off with uh, um, a regular kind of HTTP API uh, and started running into some issues there. So if you look. Um, let's take a light, for example, right? Our Rails application, when, when, when we want to turn on the light, we have to connect to the light, and then we have to turn it on. When we want to change, uh, change something about the light, so if we want to change the, the brightness or if we want to change the color of the light, each time we have to connect to the light, um, and then we have to um, turn down the brightness, or we have to um, change the color of the brightness and send new kind of RGB uh, values to the light. Um, and then again, when we want to turn it off, again, we're connecting to the light, uh, and then we're, we're turning the light off. Um, now, so we're having to connect um, to this uh, a lot of times. It's, it's uh, obviously not dry, but it's not just a stylistic issue, but it also comes, uh, becomes a performance issue as well when dealing with some of these um, uh, Internet of Things objects. So if you think about it, um, I showed you in the video um, a slider where you could change the, the brightness of, of the light. Um, just like a regular form, um, there's, it's kind of uh, got different values along each of, the, each of the way. I had That slider has 100 values. Um, it's, it's 0 to 100. Um, so if a user kind of takes that slider and just moves it up and down, um, in one second they've generated 200 requests um, to the server um, and to the light, right? And so 
imagine that's just one user. If, if you start building some kind of app with a lot of different users connected to, some, to something, um, I started to see a lot of slowdown. The light would take five minutes to go through that brightness cycle, um, or sometimes it would just crash and just something, it just, would, just wouldn't do it. <laughs> um, so, uh, so that's why I kind of started looking for um, a potential uh, alternative. Um, and the solution I found um, was uh, WebSockets. Um, and that's actually um, a lot more relevant now, um, especially um, after DHH's talk on Tuesday around uh, Action Cable. So pretty excited to see what's coming out of that. But um, the, the cool thing about WebSockets is that they allow you to uh, hold a connection open um, between the client and the server. Um, and so you can maintain um, uh, this connection uh, between, uh, between requests, um, and you can maintain the state. Um, and then kind of a side benefit that I got that I actually ended up using and needing quite a lot was um, the server send events um, that uh, you, you're not tied to kind of the response uh, request re response cycle. Um, you, you can actually um, generate events to kind of populate something in the front end as, um, as well to the client. Um, so the anatomy of the Rails app that I built, um, I'll quickly go over this and kind of get into a little bit more detail. Um, but basically, um, you get requests uh, uh, to, to interface with an object, um, again, pretty much just with a, with a front end. Um, that kind of goes to the event map, um, which is just like a Rails route, but you're actually just mapping events. Um, that then goes to the WebSocket controllers, um, and then the controllers do two things. Um, they work with your models to kind of save that, um, uh, that interaction to the database, um, because I want to kind of be able to analyze um, everything from you know, motions to when lights were on and off, and um, potentially get into some more advanced stuff later. Um, but it also kind of interfaces with the, ob with the physical object itself. Um, so I'm not going to drain this slide, so I'm going to kind of go through each of, each of the steps that I just talked about. But um, since this is in Angular and we're at RailsConf right now, um, Basically, uh, what I'm doing uh, is I'm creating a dispatcher on the front end, um, and I'm using this using the uh, WebSocket Rails. Um, so I'm using the WebSocket Rails gem um, on, the, on the back end, and they have a, um, uh, a client-side library as well. Unfortunately, the client-side library is um, uh, bundled in with the gem, and also it's in CoffeeScript, and um, I, I, I prefer JavaScript to CoffeeScript. Um, and I, I kind of wanted to pull out the, uh, the, the client part of that um, into, uh, into the Angular app. So what I did was I, I just unbundled it. Um, I've got it actually in, in a link on this slide if you guys are interested. Um, there was some interest on Stack Overflow around this. So. Um, but basically, I'm using this dispatcher that I've created. Uh, and the dispatcher create, uh, uh, triggers events uh, that then map to um, your event map on the Rails side. So this is kind of where the request first comes into the Rails um, application. Um, and as you can see, um, it maps to um, your controllers and action, actions just like you would on kind of a regular HTTP um, in, your, in, your, in your router. Um, and the syntax is uh, very familiar. You can use um, the string or the hash uh, syntax here. Um, and I, in general here, tried to be, uh, and this is kind of an example of the light um, and the coffee maker. But I tried to be um, as you know, restful as possible. So um, a create is actually turning, it on, turning the object on. Um, destroy is turning it off. Uh, update is changing some attribute about that light. Uh, and show is kind of returning uh, some status that we have uh, on, the, on, on, in, in, uh, on the object. In, in the case of the light, um, it's the color, it's the, whether it's on and off, and it's the brightness values. Um, and just as a note, like some of the code that um, I'm going to go through um, it's, I've paraphrased it a little bit for simplicity. The full source code is on GitHub, so, um, and I'll have the link uh, available for that. Um, so then kind of the next step from there is the, uh, the, uh, the controllers. And the really two important uh, things to note in the controller, the WebSocket uh, controllers allow you to create a connection that stays open. Um, again, rather than uh, working um, on a re request response cycle um, uh, like HTTP. Um, and, and the cool thing about these WebSocket uh, controllers is that um, you have this controller store uh, available, and that lets us carry over um, the connection to the physical, uh, inter uh, to the physical uh, interface across your controller methods. So rather than, again, having to connect to the light every single time with the uh, LifeX interface.new, um, we can just call that the first time that controller is hit. 
uh, and then hold that connection and then, and then use that connection over and over and, and over again in, in all of our methods. So if you look, um, like for example, in the create method, right, where you, we're referring to that uh, light, uh, light interface um, in the uh, controller store. Um, and the, the cool thing about the controller store as well is that um, that works when it's, um, uh, when the controller's first hit and it's, uh, and, and it's initialized so that anytime, whether it's one user or another user uh, connects to it, you're still using that same connection. So you're not having to reconnect over and over and over to, um, to, to, the, to the light bulb. Um, and so every controller action really does two things. Um, it, uh, again, like I mentioned, it saves uh, that interaction to the database and it actually um, inter interfaces with the object. Um, this is kind of uh, a little more detail. I'm not gonna talk through this, but just the update action that I have. I'm taking a params, uh, which is message um, here from the front end. And then uh, here it's the RGB values that I, that I want or the uh, brightness uh, value that I want and then uh, again, doing the same two things. I'm saving it to the database and then interfacing with the object. Um, domain model um, so is really, really simple um, in this application. Um, basically, uh, I've got a Sonos player, I've got a, um, a party, I've got a motion detector, which has many motion detections. Um, I've got a coffee maker, I've got a light, uh, and a light has many colors, and a, um, and, and, and a light also has many brightnesses. Um, the only thing uh, here is that, um, again, really, really simple. I've just overridden the destroy method because in our case, um, with the Internet of Things, the destroy, at least the way I've got it set up, is actually turning the object off. Um, so I actually want to save a reference to when that object was turned off. So then the interface. Um, this is kind of, um, this was kind of the most interesting and the most fun part to build um, in this application. Um, interface classes that I've built are kind of the, um, the glue between the Rails app um, and the actual physical object. Um, the interface classes are really easy to build in the case of um, smart objects like your Sonos player or your light bulb um, because um, there's a lot of APIs and gems and official, unofficial ones available out there. Um, where it's a little bit more, uh, gets a little bit trickier but also a little bit more fun is where you have um, uh, dumb objects which are not connected to the internet where you have to connect to, um, you, you have to use kind of the um, Arduino's library um, and then do a little bit of circuitry, but um, it's actually really, really easy. Um, I'm not a very big circuits guy at all, so um, if I can figure it out, yeah, anybody can. <laughs> um, so this is my motion detector um, up on the slide right now. Uh, the TS TSA, uh, I came down from New York, TSA really wasn't happy about this and uh, Somehow, um, I agree with them, it looks pretty sketchy. Um, <laughs> somehow it, it survived all of their uh, swabbing and, and testing, but uh, and it's here right now. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting, um, the motion detector was kind of one of the more, more interesting interfaces to build because unlike all of the other objects where it's an on-off, right, where you're turning the light on, turning it off, um, coffee maker, turning it on, turn it off, right? The motion detector, once you turn it on, it's actually, um, it's actually, it's not just kind of a single point in time, it's actually lo uh, on for a while. So you're actually starting to get motion detections uh, coming from this um, a motion detector. Um, also, it requires a two-way communication between the object um, and the Rails app. So it's not just the Rails app sending in a signal and being like, turn on. When there's motion, um, it needs to actually send that back to the Rails app, and we need to be able to deal with that, um, with that as well. Um, so this is enabled through uh, kind of multi-threading and server send events. Um, and this is, I know the code is tiny. I'm gonna jump into uh, more detail into all of, uh, all of this. But basically, um, the main method that I have here, uh, the, it's the start motion detector method, um, it does four things. It starts a new thread, it connects to the Arduino, um, it detects and reacts uh, to motion, and then it detects and reacts to no motion. So the first part of that, um, is where we, um, where we uh, set up a new thread. So why do we need to do this? Again, the, the, um, the motion detector is continuously, uh, continuously running. It's almost kind of like a loop. Uh, so if you think about you know, when you do loop do and then never put like a break or something, it'll just keep looping and, and, and freeze up your app. So the same thing happens. The Ardu it's continuously looking on the Ar Arduino's um, input uh, for, um, for, for motion. And if we don't get off the main thread, it actually ends up freezing up um, the application. 
um, since that's where the application is kind of running. So we, first thing we do is we get off the main thread by creating a new thread. Um, and then we start listening uh, from the Arduino on the input port that we specify. Um, the next part of the method is, um, is pretty cool. Um, and this is where we react to motion um, and a lack of motion. Um, so when motion is sensed uh, on, on, the, on the Arduino's pin that we specify as an input, and basically what happens here is when there's a motion um, that the motion detector uh, detects, it kind of sends a little impulse to the, um, to, uh, to the, pin, to the input pin, and therefore we, we, we send that back to the Rails app. Um, so what we do is we uh, save that motion to the database, um, again, keeping track of all the motions that have, that have occurred. Um, and then we, um, we send a server-generated uh, event um, to alert uh, the front end of, that, of, of the alert, to alert the client of, of, the, alert, um, of, of the fact that there's been a motion. And that's kind of why, how you start seeing um, on the graph, you see the graph turn red when there's motion uh, and then turn, back, turn blue again when there's no motion. Um, it's because it's reacting to these uh, server sent events um, that, that, that are, that are um, happening. Um, and then similarly, when there's no motion, we're sending um, just a signal to the front end to say um, there's, there's, there's no more motion, um, so you know, turn blue again. Um, and then uh, two, uh, we also send uh, kind of a count of the, the latest count of motions to, to update the graph um, dynamically. So uh, the future of the Internet of Things. Um, so in 1997, uh, Alan Kay, uh, the pioneer behind object-oriented programming and the graphical user interface, um, said, uh, today after 50 years of development, the computer is still masquerading as better paper. Uh, but in the next decade, uh, will be, the next decade will be the transition into what computing and networks uh, are really about. And we've really seen that kind of um, come, come to life and come about. I, I firmly believe that's kind of what we're seeing in the uh, Internet of Things space as well. Um, to play off of uh, Alan Kay's words, right now the Internet of Things is really uh, uh, masquerading as a better light bulb or a better thermostat, um, and you get the point, right? Um, and we're kind of in this like cool factor phase where it's really cool to be able to turn on an object um, or turn off an object with your with your app, um, and the world is kind of really captivated by this uh, so far uh, unsophisticated implementation of of this technology. Um, if you think about it, we've gone from um, a light bulb on, on uh, sorry, a light switch um, on, on a wall where you flip on and off when you walk into a room um, to an app. Um, but then when you actually walk into a dark room, you realize that you know, when you have to pull out your phone, hit your password, uh, open the app, uh, turn it on, and God forbid if you have multiple different brands of light bulbs, uh, you have to open the app for each one, right? That's, that's annoying. Um, it's, it, it's not actually very functional. So we've gone back to having these light switches on the wall, but these light switches are now connected to the Wi-Fi and they're Internet of Things light switches. So cool, cool stuff, but you know, we haven't really seen um, that much um, incremental value uh, being delivered in the space yet. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more of it um, in the next five years. So, um, so where do I think uh, the Internet of Things is going? Um, <laughs> I think uh, right now we're in the stage in between where we have these disconnected dumb objects all over the place um, to now starting to connect a lot of these objects. We're st starting to see connected everything now. Um, but I think that's, they're kind of still working in silos. Again, you have different apps for different, um, different brands. And you know, even if it's within the same company, there might be different, um, different apps to, to, to work with these things. So I think the next step from there is centralizing um, a, lot of, a lot of the objects. So having one platform where you can be, be able to control all your different objects um, uh, in one place. And we're starting to see a little bit of that as well. Um, I know Apple's HomeKit is supposed to do a little bit of that. Um, Amazon Echo, um, they just announced that they're going to have um, integration of a few kind of Internet of Things objects in there. Um, so that's kind of where I think the next step is. But I think the kind of ultimate step and where we really want to end up with the inter Internet of Things um, is where, where we're actually integrating all of these, where, um, where all of these smart objects are working with one another. Um, doesn't matter what brand they are or, um, or you know, what, what, what they actually do. They're actually working together um, and, and in, in, in these kind of routines. So um, you, know, you can imagine an app where, you know, or you can imagine a situation where you're coming home late from work and you're, you're, your home almost knows that. So it starts heating up the food right when you're you know, far you know, close enough, the lights turn on when you walk in, the doors unlock, 
um, everything kind of works, uh, works you know, together and seamlessly. Um, so my goal for today was really just to show you that building an Internet of Things app um, is really easy. Um, and you know, this app took me just, you know, didn't take me very long at all to build. It's obviously very simple. But um, especially the skills that we have um, as, as Rails developers, um, and I think it's going to get even easier now that um, you know, with the announcement of Action Cable and it's going to be kind of more integrated in Rails. Um, uh, so I think that's going to be um, kind of make it very, very easy for all of us to kind of start building and kind of prototyping these Internet of Things applications. Um, I think it would be awesome to see more uh, Rails developers uh, to be part of this, you know, Internet of Things revolution um, and kind of push us towards, you know, the Jetsons um, as opposed to Flintstone. Um, and so I hope that a lot of you um, are already building, um, will build uh, an, an inter Internet of Things application soon. Thank you so much for, uh, for listening to my talk. Um, I think